Welcome to the latest edition of the Mind Gut Conversation. In this podcast, we deal with topics related to the mind, the gut, the microbiome, the environment, and overall health and nutrition. Today, I have a particular pleasure to talk to Ryland Engelhardt. Um, I'll say a few words about you and then with a, with a personal twist to it. So um, for those people who have not heard that name, uh, Ryland is the co-founder and executive director of Kiss the Ground organization. And he's also the producer of Kiss the Ground, the documentary film, which can be seen on uh, Netflix. And um, he's also an entrepreneur and um, has started is running two restaurants, um, organic plant-based restaurants. One is called Cafe Gratitude. Uh, the other one, Gracias Madre in, in Southern California. He's also um, co-creator of another award-winning film, May I Be Frank. Um, and we had the opportunity to talk a couple of weeks ago, ago for the first time. It was, um, by um, synchronicity that the two of us met because um, his name was brought to my attention. I mean, I've, I've seen the movie, I've been to the restaurant several times, <laughs> but I didn't really connect it to an individual. And so that happened because I gave a lecture um, to, to students at, at UCLA about um, brain gut microbiome interactions and its relationship to not only gut microbial health, but also uh, soil microbial health and the environment. And I guess must have inspired one student who also interned um, at the Kiss the Ground organization. And so she single-handedly facilitated this, this introduction. So I'm glad this happened. I, I'm a strong believer in synchronicities. So <laughs> I'm glad we have this, this communication line established now. And, so we had a conversation a couple of weeks ago, and I am had a series of um, questions. So one is related to when I read the, your short bio on your, on your website, you say a few things that I find really intriguing. Um, and I just wanted to hear your comment on this. So you call yourself a love activist. What, what exactly is, is a love activist? <laughs> uh, good, good question. Uh, yeah, well, uh, love, um, a love activist. Yeah, really, um, I had the opportunity of being raised by parents who, um, from a very early on age, shared with me their sort of, as parents always do, their worldview, their philosophy. Um, and really at an early age, I had a spiritual understanding uh, or learning that all of life is one, all of life is connected. Um, and that love, uh, love is our nature. And when we're being loving, um, you know, we're considering the whole, uh, we're considering that we're a part of a much bigger whole. And so we, are much less apt to be selfish, destructive, harmful. And at a, at a certain point in my life, I really got that um, love was the, the big thing. Like what, what we're doing here as human beings is uh, trying to uh, remember our nature and our nature is love. Uh, if we think about the best moments of our lives, it's when we were uh, expressing and receiving love. Um, and so, uh, you know, love can be something that we only see in relationship to romantic relationships or parental relationships or, uh, you know, some kind of faith or spirituality. Um, but I really saw that the, and again, this is not something new or unique to me, but that really, it's about moment to moment, who we're being, who are we being in each interaction? And um, so can, I took on the activism of every day, every moment, every interaction is an opportunity to be love. 
And I used to have on my voicemail for years, maybe from 10 years, it said, hello, my name is Ryland. Uh, you've reached my voicemail. My answer is yes, and my message is love. <laughs> um, and, and so it was just this experiment of, uh, you know, being actively expressing uh, love, uh, meeting people and sharing love. You know, when I was many, many years ago, I was, I was at this seminar and I was um, participating and registering people in this seminar and I'm back in the room and uh, uh, this, this person comes and they're signing up for, the, regis the, for the, the seminar and there was a little girl, maybe about eight years old, and she came over to me and uh, she said, what's your name? And she like came and she was like, can I sit on your lap? And she, I was like, sure. And she like came and she just like hanging out with me. And, you know, she was just so present and so loving and there was no, she wasn't wondering whether I was going to be around in an hour or whether I was going to be, you know, uh, if we'd see each other again, she just got that the best way to be in the present moment was to be loving and to be kind and to, to, to experience this, this intimacy of love. Um, and it was just this moment of like, wow, there's such this purity of love and presence with no attachment. And um, so I've always just been a student of how do I catalyze and be an expression uh, of love wherever I go and whatever conversation I'm having. Um, can I remember to be love as my North Star? And so actually me and my dad, um, when I was probably about 21, went to a, a tattoo parlor called Java and Joe's on Petrero uh, and 16th in the mission in San Francisco and got a tattoo. It says B, B on one side and love on the other. And it, it faces me, it doesn't face other people. It faces me. And again, it's like we mostly live in California or I live in California, so I got short sleeves all the time. And it's a declaration of commitment of who I choose to be uh, in the world. And I'm gonna be actively not passively being love, I'm actively going to be being an expression of love. That's absolutely remarkable the way you say this. Uh, you know, it's sort of a expression of total empathy, of conditionless empathy with 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 life and with all life forms and and, and the world around you. I, I think that's really um, when. So you said this this you had a eureka moment early in life. How how old were you when that happened? Uh, the, the eureka moment that had me create kiss the ground or the eureka moment what eureka i've had a few uh, i've greatly had a few eureka moments <laughs> um, well, um, you had this, this 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 vision or experience as a as a as a kid that you know love is the key that is the key element of your being and of, of your expression towards the world around you yeah so you know i would say that that has been a um, a re-emergent um, awakening uh, that's definitely come in, in in circulation in my in my over many many years. There's been lots of touch points that have brought me back to that clear and focused uh, truth and remembrance. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's definitely been you know there was some the one I was describing was actually not me. I, I was realizing. I, I was observing an eight-year-old girl um, who was interacting with me, and I was realizing, wow, she so gets it. She's so um, present and in love and being love, and yet there's no, her, her attachment to it, the, the idea of some security around it, or it needs some kind of um, particular framework. She just got, no, we can be present and we can express love. Um, so that was just one one moment of kind of that um, that message, um, but I definitely have I've experienced it um, you know through early life through you know my relationship with my parents and then you know even um, again I don't know how comfortable you are to talk about this and you can edit it but like um, you know the the plant medicine ayahuasca has been a very profound. Mm -hmm. um, you know, experience that's also bring brought me into that space of remembrance of oh, that, the the I thought life was about all this other stuff. Oh, it's about being love. Oh, 
Ah, I get it. So again, it's, it's, it's come in, in many different whispers, uh, many different um, sort of emergent moments. Um, even one time I, I remember, um, you know, I, I remember driving across the Bay, the Bay Bridge in San Francisco and I was uh, singing, um, I, I, I'm into kirtan music, you know, devotional chanting. And I was, I was chanting this devotional chant and I didn't know what the words meant. It was just some Sanskrit um, Krishna Das chanting chant and I'm singing along and I'm in the car alone and I, I, I get moved to tears. I start crying in the car and I'm, I'm just so moved because I realized that most of what I do in life is for the observation of others. Like I'm, I'm doing things to be noticed, to be seen, to be, um, to, to, I'm doing this to get recognized for something. And here was this moment where it was just this pure expression of devotion and praise and, and love. And I was like, oh, here it is again. Here is this experience of remembering, oh, wow. The, the whole point of life is to express this, um, you know, this, this, this nature that we are um, unbridled and, you know, as an expression to, you know, to the universe, to the creator, to another human being, which is part of the creation, which is part of the creator. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, there's just, there's been many, many moments um, that have led to this continual awakening and awareness of um, my life is for being an expression of love. And so that's why I wrote that on my bio that I'm a, a love activist because really wonderful. Really I don't know, I, you know, I don't know how many people uh, realize that story that you just told me when you when they just go over this bio, you know, what, what this term. No, means, but... I, I think you, you, you unpacked it d definitely deeper than most people kind of like laugh at it. And it's kind of cheeky and like, oh, yeah, love activists, um, you know, sounds sounds kind of quacky, wacky and a little new agey. And um, but yeah, I, it's it's nice to unpack it and be able to give some authentic expression to what it means. I mean, the unique thing about you is that you actually translated this this emotional, this strong emotional feeling and attachment to the world through love into very concrete, practical accomplishments. I mean, that you know, so a lot of some people you know would share your your general attitude and philosophy, but few people then manage to translate this into into the real world, particularly. In a in a materialistic place like Los Angeles or Southern California, or uh, you know, um, following this this emotion of love is not necessarily the the easiest way to uh, or the most straightforward way to success to commercial success. But you started two restaurants which are very popular. I mean, it's hard to get a place there. Um, and how how did this come about? I mean, how did you um, decide to become an entrepreneur and was that your first um, shot at being an entrepreneur a very, very successful one but um so yeah so yeah to give more background and content context uh i come from a family that has been pretty serial entrepreneurs and i saw them build um kind of a, a rags to riches business of a clothing manufacturing business that my mom created from making clothes for me and my sister in the, you know, in a house, a room in the house, um, to selling farmers markets to then building something. Uh, and they also did it in a way where they, I saw them building the fibrin of um, bringing consciousness and love and compassion and connectivity. Um, into uh, their business in a, in, a, in a very unique and early way before kind of the whole, you know, idea of B corporations or triple bottom line or conscious capitalism. I saw them bring spirituality into business uh, in very, in, in a successful way. Um, and mm -hmm. they demonstrated that throughout my lifetime. And, uh, and, and so when they, and again, just to be be clear, my my dad and stepmom um, were the founders of Cafe Gratitude um, in in the Bay Area back in 2004, and I came and started working with them 
in the first year of business. And we, we, me and my brother and my, my parents helped grew the business to six restaurants in the Bay Area. Um, and that then included Gracias Madre, which was uh, a whole other story where we ended up going to Mexico to visit families of our employees who couldn't go back and forth. And so we went down there for a wedding. And on that trip, we kind of got inspired by Gracias Madre, thank you, Mother, thank you, Mother Earth, thank you to the Divine Mother that's represented in Mexican culture through the Guadalupe image, um, and um, and thank you to the, the 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 terrestrial or the the Earth Mother who sets the table and feeds the family and nurtures you know nurture nurtures the family, and so um, you know and again that it wasn't like we were like oh how are we going to make money by it was really like we got inspired by you know, one, we love Mexican food, um, love, we, one, we were into organics and how do we have clean, healthy food for health and wellness for humanity and well as the planet. Um, and then, you know, because we were connecting and, you know, having love and connection and it, it had become, uh, you know, our community, the, when you work in restaurants, you become, you know, your family with the people you work with all the time. And so we became, you know, friends and family with, our employees, which led us to Mexico, which led us to this experience and um, this this thought of, oh, wow, gracias madre. And that, you know, we were originally was going to be an organic taco shop and it turned into, um, you know, a, 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 what we call a food church, uh, a, a, a devotion to the, the, to the divine mother um, with good ingredients and healthy, delicious food and even a little tequila and mezcal um, of the organic fashion or kind. Um, so, um, so yeah, so basically we, we started in the Bay Area, me and my brother and my, my folks grew the business um, to seven restaurants in the Bay Area over a six year period. Uh, my parents sort of moved away from the business. They went to start farming themselves. Uh, I, had, a, I had, had an inspiration to go to Los Angeles. One, I had a, um, a girlfriend there um, and two, I had this idea, and again, I, I've always been quite a dreamer and a, um, you know, just a, a vision. I have big visions, uh, you know, and I, I, I kind of have a, a childlike innocence and exuberance, and maybe you could even say um, uh, a little bit naive um, about the world or reality. And but yet, you know, my naiveness or my innocence has allowed me to be a beginner's mind at things and can somehow catalyze things forward that may wouldn't have happened because I would have thought of all the things that would go wrong so I just wouldn't start. Um, but yeah, so I ended up having the idea of coming to Los Angeles to open uh, a restaurant here, not because I wanted to just have more plant-based food in LA, but really it was, it was like a, a spiritual you know, mission of how to bring a business that has the consciousness of love and gratitude, cafe gratitude, um, to uh, Los Angeles, which could be seen around the world as maybe the belly of the beast and, you know, something that perpetuates a lot of cultures of vanity and selfishness and materiality and how to, how, you know, to be able to come to Los Angeles, the belly of the beast. And as you know, this is actually, I've used this reference. It's never perfect, more a perfect reference than for you in this podcast, because I'd go to the belly of the beast and bring good bacteria, good biology to the belly of the beast. And I could heal the belly from inside the belly. You know, that's where health begins in the gut microbiome to, to bring it all the way home to you. Um, so that was kind of the, literally the big, the big foolish idea was to come to Los Angeles, bring plant-based cuisine, bring the consciousness of love and gratitude. You know, we, we moved down here um, with 15 of my best friends and employees that worked in the restaurant. We all lived in a community house uh, on Alvarado Terrace and, you know, right out between like uh, Koreatown and kind of off of Hoover and Venice mm -hmm. and the 10. And there's the old historic homes. And we, we had three homes that we had occupied um, with ended up being maybe 20, 20 plus of us. And many of us worked in the restaurants and we were this community and um, we were bringing the message of, of gratitude and uh, healthy living and community and togetherness uh, to Los Angeles, a culture that could be seen as 
other than that in many ways by many people. And that was kind of the idea. And, you know, it, 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 it struck as a, it was a hit. We, we opened our first restaurant on Larchmont in Van, I mean, in, in, on Larchmont in um, Larchmont Village, just out of Hollywood. And it was, it was, we, we hit, we hit lightning. It was like, you couldn't get in. There was a line out the front and we were making, you know, raw food and quinoa bowls. And, but the, 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 the energy was alive. It was, it was vibrant. We were asking people weird questions when they came in, we'd ask them, you know, what, what moves them from their head to their heart? Um, you know, what, 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 what inspires them? What are they passionate about? And, you know, it, it kind of broke the third wall of how this is like, it's, it's, it's a business they're serving us, but it feels like family and community. And I feel comfortable and people walk around the restaurant and connect with other tables. And it was just this whole thing. Um, and it became, you know, very popular, um, to all different kinds of people. And, uh, you know, that grew from one restaurant to seven restaurants over the last 10 years in Los Angeles. And, um, you know, my brother runs the restaurant, um, as the COO and we have a partner, uh, Lisa and Chris Bond, right. Who are kind of the, the folks who we partnered with when me and my brother moved down here, my parents stayed in the Bay area and we moved down here kind of to, you know, open the next chapter of Cafe Gratitude. So that's amazing. So I, I, I you know, I thought it was like this um, opening of a box with uh, the term love activist, but this has opened a whole other box that um, I don't know how many people know this detail. I, I find it absolutely fascinating what you just, you know, talked about. Uh, uh, it's, it's, I mean, it seems many of the things that you have done are, are, I mean, how should I say it? <clears throat> I mean, literally actions of love. I mean, like you, you, you didn't get involved in the restaurant business to, you know, to make a lot of money. I mean, this, this has always been infused with, with this other spiritual side of yourself and your family, um, uh, you know, which I find also really remarkable that, you, that many of the things that you do is really continuation of what your family, uh, the attitude your family had towards to its, you know, workers and employees and, uh, and the benefit for, for, for other humans. So how would you say, I mean, I, I sort of partially know the answer, but I mean, there's clearly a, um, a shift in the younger generation. I mean, talking about the, the, the vegan restaurant, there's a shift in the population, in, in the younger population to become more aware really of um, food, not just as something that you, you know, buy and munch down while you're driving to work or coming home from work, but it's something that is a lot more. There's this connection to where it comes from and um, what's, you know, particularly with the omnivore diet, what suffering of animals is involved by the time you get this. Um, and, and, and I think from what I've seen, and I look at this really from a from a health standpoint, or originally primarily from a health standpoint as a gastroenterologist. Um, what do you think? Um, I mean, wh where is this going? Is this? Do you think there will be a continued increase in people that uh, are attracted to um, either eat less meat, which already would be an, an uh, you know a step forward, or even towards veganism? Do you see that as a Will this become a, you know, that whole generations change? It's so ingrained in American culture, right? It's so quintessential American, the, the steak and the hamburger and, and the, the hot dogs. It, it's kind of, it's almost hard to imagine how this will change on a large scale. What, what is your thought about that? I, I mean, I would say that, I mean, it, it, it's, miraculous the transformation that I've seen in just the last 15 years. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, un, it's unbelievable. The, you know, when we, when we opened Cafe Gratitude, there was no such thing in the public domain of cold pressed juice. There was nobody eating kale. There was nobody eating quinoa. There was no almond milk on the shelf of the store. There was, um, you know, there was no such thing. Or there was no cold brew coffee um, because it was low acid. Like as far as like in the, the, the so the world is 
is drastically, and again, these are just small drops in the bucket of a bigger um, sort of environment or condition, but I just point to them as reference points for, yes, the consciousness of food and its impact on our bodies and the planet is very, or, or not very, it's becoming much, much more connected and clear. Younger generations are clear about that connection and they want the truth about that connection. Um, and they, um, you know, they're not, they're not up for just kind of the smoke and mirrors greenwashing. They want the truth about it. And uh, they're not afraid to call you out if you're full of it or if you're if you're um, if you're saying one thing and doing another. You know, I, I think that, yeah, I mean, as far as America becoming vegan, not not likely. Um, but I don't even think that that's the most healthy, you know, reality of, you know, I think, um, you know, I, I think we're eating less meat. We're eating, you know, better food in general, understanding where it's coming from, because um, it's not, it's not the, it's not the what, it's the how it's being grown. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we can eat, you know, we can eat um, beautiful heirloom, um, you know, green corn that has all kinds of phytonutrients, or we can eat, you know, crap. Monsanto glyphosate ridden, you know, um, corn, genetically modified corn that you know, they're not even the same thing. So, um, you know, it's not about, I mean, yes, we want to be eating, uh, you know, the idea that, you know, the food pyramid and the dairy and the meat and, you know, how that was manipulated through, you know, lobby groups mm -hmm. and telling us what we, what we needed to eat. Um, you know, I think that the, you know, the, the, the packaging around that and the, the, the narrative around that is definitely changing. Um, you know, I, I'm actually on the other side of, I'm a, this is kind of a little controversial, but I'm a little kind of, um, I, I'm a little bit mm, concerned about the meta narrative of like, we need to grow meat in a Petri dish. We need to have, you know, all these plant-based proteins you know, to replace everything meat because that's going to save the planet, but yet they're being grown in monoculture with, you know, farming chemicals, super intensive, um, you know, that, you know, this idea that like, it's a plant, it's, you know, like, it's a plant, it's good for you. You know, it, it, it's kind of like, um, I, I almost feel like there's, there's become big business that has totally got that narrative. And well, it's true in some ways, it's, it's, again, it's, it's never just one thing. It's more nuanced. It's, um, you know, it's, 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 what is that vegetable, you know, and where was it grown and how was it grown? What kind of soil was it grown in? You know, for instance, you know, organic battling, um, you know, is hydroponic organics mm -hmm. and, you know, can we just force feed nutrients into plants versus having the microbial breakdown and transmission of these phytonutrients and this, this um, transference happen, which makes things bioavailable and healthy for humans versus just nitrates, um, mm. you know, being in a lettuce leaf and we're ex experiencing, you know, a nitrate, which could potentially be, you know, a carcinogen. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I think that there's never been a greater interest. It's almost like, you know, at, at, at part of people's identity was, you know, what kind of music you listen to or, um, and now it's like, you know, what, you know, your, your, your food is part of your politics, part of your, um, you know, part of your identity, part of uh, who you are and what you believe in, because we see the ripple effect of our food system almost impacts everything else. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, the whole where kiss the ground came from, for me, which was this kind of even next level revelation beyond just organic plant-based, but was this whole realization of regeneration and ecosystem thinking and how can we um, manage land in a way that mimics nature and has land and 
health get better versus just trying to conserve, sustain, um, you know, uh, do less harm versus actually how do we focus on um, catalyzing more life, more vitality, more ecosystem for services, um, more functionality. Um, and so that's, that's the kind of the, the context that I'm most excited about really championing at this time is regeneration. Yeah, I mean, you brought up, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit off the regeneration theme, but you brought up this concept or, or this topic of um, plant-based uh, foods, uh, meat substitutes. And um, I, I share your, your skepticism. Um, and I think you only need to look at who are the main investors in this business. It's the same people that are behind the agribusiness right now. Um, yes. They can use... They can do, uh, almost use the same techniques of growing soybeans and that they, they're going to put into this food. So it's not going to change anything in terms of um, the impact on, on um, maybe there's less uh, methane production because, you know, the, the, the cows are taken out. But um, it's also highly processed food. So like this criteria that we should eat healthy food that's uh, as minimally processed as absolutely necessary. Um, some people have said it's a it's a it's a transition period in shifting the you know the habits away from 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 this obsession with with meat based food products. But even that's not true because if you make it look so similar, it's the same thing as with sugar substitutes. They're not really good for your health. You know they um, you you mimic exactly the the what you continue the the addiction to 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 sweets and and, and sugar by switching it to substitutes. I, I think the only benefit is probably for the animals. You know, I think that's, I, I would say these plant-based substitutes for meat, you know, one different benefit they have is for, is, is, is for the animals that, uh, that are currently involved in this, in our food production. Um, yeah, that was just, I just wanted to say that comment. So you would, you would not serve this in any of your restaurants, I imagine, yeah. No way. Yeah, no, I, I um, yeah, I, I definitely think the, the co-opting of the plant-based diet and plant-based substitute meats are going to save the world. And, you know, we're going to, um, yeah, as you said, the money and the investment behind that is uh, usual suspects that have not been um, values aligned to making a healthy um, equitable, um, you know, planet, food system, community, society. Um, to me, it, it seems mostly like it's just driving a, a narrative that's just a, another good business, um, and it doesn't it doesn't feel like it has um, a lot of credibility in its values and and its and its um, mission. Mm, yeah, yeah so I, mean, I totally agree with that. It's it's kind of it kind of reminds me of how a lot of the marketing people from the from the cigarette companies moved on into the food business because they you know they were experts in um, making people addicted to a, to a product. So before it was the tobacco, and now it's you know things in food that make people hooked on it, high fat, high sugar. Um, it's a similar example. You know, there's a very as, as we both know, there's a very powerful lobby, extremely powerful lobby behind all these businesses that are not necessarily good for our health. Um, and the players don't really change. I mean, they just shift, you know, their, 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 their main focus and what they attach their expertise to and their marketing power to. Yes. So, I mean, coming to the regeneration and um, uh, coming to your movie, um, so obviously what we talked about in the beginning, um, being a love activist that explains the, the, the name of the movie, <laughs> Kiss the Ground. Um, how, how did this come about? How, how did you move from that? I find really fascinating from you know, being involved in the, in the restaurant business um, and doing some pretty you know, fundamental things that very few people would do to move down here with the whole restaurant staff to to LA and 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 start something but how did you get from there to the to making that movie 
Yeah, again, I think it's um, one one love activist uh, kind of, you know, initiation to the next. But um, I, I, I made a film called May I Be Frank um, about the transformation of a 300 pound Sicilian New Yorker from Brooklyn who had given up on life and was on antidepressants and uh, was, um, had hepatitis and um, all of his relationships were in shambles. And he came into our restaurant and after we saw the film Super Size Me, uh, we had this idea of using Cafe Gratitude's food and philosophy to transform someone from sickness to wellness. And so I took him on and literally bought a camera from a friend. And we literally, again, over seven years, filled a shoebox of, you know, of, of little tapes. Uh, and finally, after seven years, produced a film and it came out and it was a beautiful story about a man's healing, um, you know, going from sickness to wellness and, you know, all the layers and the emotional, spiritual, physical transformations. And so uh, because I made that film and because I was connected and, you know, um, part of the leadership of Cafe Gratitude, I got invited to go to New Zealand to give a talk on sacred commerce, which was, um, which is the business philosophy. And my books, my folks wrote a book about, um, you know, what is a model of sacred commerce where we can bring the sacred or you could say love or spirituality um, or kindness or compassion um, or consciousness to a business um, and not have it be solely driven by the bottom line. And so uh, I went to New Zealand to give a talk about sacred commerce and also to show the film. And while I was there, I got to witness a panel of experts talking about can human beings sustain themselves on planet Earth? And basically five out of the six experts said no. Um, we're in a dire, you know, we're heading into the Anthropocene or the six mass extinction uh, that we, uh, you know, we've lost one third of the phytoplankton in the ocean. Ocean acidification will, you know, um, destroy the rest of that phytoplankton uh, that tanks the oceans, then the whole ocean ecosystem flatlines. Uh, you know, we're over at 415 parts per million you know, carbon, that carbon's going to the app, you know, just all the different ecosystem collapses that, um, you know, could be pointed to. And basically, I was, you know, a moment of totally being humbled and flabbergasted with the reality of what the truth that they were sharing. And I could see because there was tears and there was, um, you know, such an emotional aliveness about what was being shared. I could just tell that it was real. And then the last guy who spoke um, was a gentleman by the name of Graham Sait, um, who would actually be another great guest for your podcast, Graham Sait. Uh, and basically he communicated uh, the story of how humus could save the world, uh, that how we do agriculture and how we manage land could actually be um, the system that could go from arguably the most destructive system on the planet to going past net zero, but actually could be the redeemer um, that actually could uh, solve and heal a lot of the problems um, that have been created by agriculture and by other um, dysfunctional industries. And so uh, I, I, in this moment, I, I saw this message. I saw a bigger circle of life being connected. I was like, that is real, true, possible. And whatever he just said, I drank that Kool-Aid and I got it. It was like, bing! Again, there was just nothing more powerful than the than idea that was like, oh my God, I could see. It was literally a, a moment of the earth is flat to the earth is round. And it became this, oh, we're either just heading off the edge of the cliff and maybe we'll be able to turn, off, turn the car around, but not likely, we'll probably just slow it off and go over the edge to, oh, we actually can cycle this system and work with the system and that we could be as human beings, part of a beneficial, part of the beneficial life 
um, what is called, you know, we could be a keystone species in the ecosystem that if we had a right relationship to the ecosystem, we could actually stimulate more life and more ecosystem function and more regeneration and capture more sunlight and pump more carbon into the, sh into the soil. And we could balance our climate and we could produce food um, that's nutrient dense. And it just, it made sense. I was just like, oh my God, that's so intuitive. That's so um, intrinsic. That's not like some complicated thing. Like everyone can get that. It was like, it, and it, it almost felt like it wasn't just, I was learning it. I was remembering this obvious nature that we are. And, um, and so the, yeah, that, that moment really, it was, a, that, that was a, you, um, a eureka moment where I really saw and felt in my heart where there was this, um, this full on, like, this is true, clear, like, whisper from the beyond that was like, this is true and your life is to support and help catalyze this new awareness, this consciousness of regeneration, that this is possible, that there is a, there's another way that we can go forward that is, that is um, intuitive, that's remembered, you know, and, and again, it's not new. This is, this is some, this is a view of life. This is a, a way of being that many indigenous cultures have, you know, on all continents mm. have held in who they are and how they relate to nature and to life and what their role is. You know, I, I think in, 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 in one way it was distinguished as our original instructions. Mm. Our original instructions were to be good stewards of the earth, of soil, of water, of, and so the, um, yeah, this just became the great awakening of, of, of my life. And I essentially made the next seven years of my life um, about how to catalyze this awareness and consciousness shift that I had to where this could be an, an adopted idea um, at the largest you know, scale of consciousness so that we could start taking different actions and behaviors and building environments and infrastructure to support um, this um, shift in awareness. And so in turn, you know, I ended up building with one of my good childhood friends, um, a nonprofit organization um, in California called Kiss the Ground. And we are an education and advocacy nonprofit that really has been storytelling um, and uplifting the message and story and education around that regeneration is possible. And our mission is to awaken people to the possibilities of regeneration, um, because that was that experience that shifted my consciousness through that one panel discussion. And the thought became, uh, okay, how can I create content education, tell stories, uplift individuals, um, you know, bring, bring this sort of um, marginalized story um, from, you know, pioneering farmers to indigenous, you know, elders to, um, you know, um, forward thinking, you know, philosophers um, that understood this interconnectivity of life, you know, as Thich Nhat Hanh said, you know, interbeing, understood interbeing, that we are, that we are not separate from uh, the sun, the, the leaf, uh, the microorganism, the, you know, the carbon molecule, the hydrogen molecule, all these things, we are, uh, we are that, we are interbeing that. And, uh, you know, back to that idea of, you know, where consciousness is going is my, my, my hope and my prayer is that, you know, where we're going is into a, a consciousness where it really understands that we are interconnected with all of life and how do we start and again baby steps you know it's 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 not it's it's easy to pontificate about this philosophical ideas um but you know how do we start to make shifts in our behavior and the infrastructure that we build in this idea and in service of regeneration in service of we are all one how would we behave knowing that where we where we give 
or where we destroy, we are there. We're, we're there receiving that destruction or life-giving um, contribution because um, we're not, we're not, we're not yeah, separate. Yeah. yeah, so, I mean, this kind of reminds me, I think I mentioned this in our previous conversation. So we've, we've been working on this, on, on a documentary ourselves called The Interconnected Planet. Um, which looks at many of these same questions in different aspects of our society, from the corporate world to the medical world to science. Um, and this kind of made me optimistic to see. Um, I first, being a scientist, I saw this happening in, in science where I grew up, you know, and, and, and was trained in separating everything and making experiments where everything is move to the side and you just have this single simple cause and effect principle forgetting the whole network that normally uh, you know uh, binds this this reality together to one of um so we've seen this and we've talked to people in a that have a positive view on this on this in, you know emerging interconnectedness consciousness and it made me really optimistic despite the fact that you could really say yes we are you know, heading towards the cliff because, you know, half of the world is not right now, not on that same wavelength. Um, even if it is hit by the worst, uh, you know, environmental catastrophes. Um, um, but so we came away with a really positive um, uh, spirit of this. And um, so one of the concepts talking to um, some prominent Buddhist monk, um, this concept that we in the West have pursued um, over the last, you know, several thousand, like two thousand years, of the self and you know the self sort of being separate from from the rest, from the animals, and from and sort of that the mission is to subdue the rest of the world and you know to be the uh, to be the ruler of it, totally you know ignoring the, the interconnectedness. I think that's taken Western civilization on a path that on the one hand was extremely successful in terms of gave us, you know, science and being able to go to the moon or to Mars. But the collateral damage that came with this, with this focus on, on the self and its, um, you know, superiority about everything else around us. Uh, is now becoming apparent in, in in many aspects of life, and climate change being the biggest one, I would say, uh, health epidemics and pandemics, um, mm -hmm. you know, being something that is even closer to home for a lot of people. So, I I kind of share your optimism. I think just based on what is happening in the most unlikely places, um, you know, this whole B Corp movement. Um, the um, emergence or the, the increasing popularity of, of largely plant-based restaurants. Uh, so I mean, there's many, and, and, and in science, you know, we can no longer do science without doing network science. We, we have to understand reality in terms of networks. We cannot, they're not individual genes, there's not individual molecules, even individual microbes. They're all parts of ecosystem, of ecosystems and to understand it really and extract what makes some uh, ecosystem healthy, you have to look at reality very differently. In, in many ways, similar to what you have arrived with, with you know, in this, uh, on your spiritual journey. So I, I find it interesting talking to somebody like yourself who came to the same conclusion from a very different uh, angle. And I've, I've experienced this now several times that people don't have to uh, end up, I mean, they end up in at the same place, but they come to it from very different directions, and uh, you know, having taken different paths to it, um, which is really that's really encouraging, and and I think spreading the word and changing the consciousness of people is definitely something that's that's very high in my priority list as well, because I think without a change in this consciousness change will not be possible. You know, you're not gonna do it just by, you know, making meat more expensive or, I mean, there's, there's, there's gotta be something else people have to see the reason why, you know, why you're doing it and what it does for for the planet and for your own health. So I, you know, I could listen to you for, 
for a long time because it's it's just really inspiring the way you tell it um and you know there is i mean the good thing is there is there's a growing number of people who in in leadership position influential positions in you almost could say keystone positions in the ecosystem that have changed their um their, their consciousness is not just Buddhist monks anymore, it's people in civilian life, you know, and, uh, and as I said, even in the most unlikely places like corporations. And uh, I just watched the, the 2020 talk from the CEO of, um, of, uh, of Walmart, uh, my friend Paul Hawken, um, I hope he doesn't mind me saying, wrote the speech for that, that mm -hmm. CEO. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so we were having a conversation yesterday and then it had me go look at the, the speech and it's beautiful. Um, and it's quite declarative and quite, you know, they, they declared themselves, you know, stepping into becoming a regenerative company. And you could say, oh, you know, bah humbug, they're a big, but they actually, you know, they made a commitment in 2005 to being, you know, one of the largest sources of um, you know, commercial business uh, relying on alternative energy sources, and they're now the largest, you know, um, independent business um, that is relying on alternative energies. Um, and they've 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 created, you know, their box is 100% recycled. They've, you know, they're like 80%, you know, uh, zero waste in their supply chain. I mean, it's quite impressive for a behemoth of a, a behemoth of a company. Yeah, no. um, and obviously they sell lots of other products that are crap. And, but, um, you know, that's, that's encouraging and inspiring. Um, and there are, you know, other examples, uh, definitely, you know, Patagonia, Yvonne Chouinard is a, is a good example. Um, we also interviewed, I mean, this is a story by itself. We interviewed the, um, the former CEO of Danone, the yogurt and uh, you know water company, um, who's who's not only an extreme mountain climber but also a philosopher, very similar views as as you know you've expressed here, and um, and he tried to turn that company around in a very radical way, you know, with with principles um, of uh, sustainability and regenerative agriculture and. Um, the sad end of the story is, I mean, uh, um, six months or a year after we interviewed him, he was sacked by his board because, um, you know, the um, the sales and the and the profits during the pandemic um, went down, where they went up for other companies that are competitors, and uh, you know, it was blamed on on his uh, that he's not realistic about what sells, for example. You know, he wanted to get rid of sugar from all their yogurt products. Um, and obviously that decreases sales. You know, a lot of people are not ready to do that. So, um, mm. yeah, but, but as, as you said, I mean, I, I don't know the Walmart CEO, but big companies, I, I think, have a, a huge potential to, or a, a huge role to play in this, in this paradigm shift. And uh, hopefully there will be more along these lines. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the B Corp movement is another attempt to do that. Um, um, but there's, there's, there's a lot of positive signs. You know, I think it's easy to fall into this negativity and pessimism. I think it's a lot of positive signs. And besides that, the planet is, is a very sophisticated ecosystem and ecosystems are um, resilient and resistant to change into collapse i mean some of them the, 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 the thought that the thought just came into my head like yeah i mean hasn't there been a, an asteroid that hit the planet and created total flames and dust and exactly, this, exactly. you know and it, it 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 came back um you know so yeah i mean it, it 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 may not be good for our next generation or you know two i mean again i i, I am i am optimistic um that human beings are waking up and that we um when we get on our when we get faced with a, a real taste of our mortality or or our extinction um we we can become um we can become um you know much more 
we, transformation is possible. We, 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 can, we can align our values in a, quick, in a much quicker way. Um, so um, yeah, I mean, it, there, is, there is signs, I mean, there's lots of things that could be lot, very discouraging, but there is still beautiful expressions of, um, of, of, of nature's inherent intelligence and genius and adaptability. And there's also amazing examples of human ingenuity and human consciousness understanding this uh, interconnectedness and this responsibility that we have to future generations and that we do, it's, it's no longer just playing lip service to uh, we're changing, but it actually is on our clock and our watch to, to make real changes. And I, I believe that there's a greater uh, truth and urgency and uh, reality to people willing to change. So that, I am, I am hopeful for that. I know yeah, I have so to, maybe I, I that's, have to, a, that's a good way to uh, close this conversation. I mean, this could go on for some time and, and I do hope we'll have many more of these conversations in the future, possibly even some interactions on some joint projects that, you know, love to do that um, with your organization and maybe even with the film. Um, so I, I I think for any anybody who who doubted you know the importance um, and also I would say who doubted the power of the mind, um, listening to this to your stories and 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 to your convictions are uh, you know they 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 will convince and have probably already convinced a lot of people uh, that that you have touched and encountered um, and so I really would like to thank you for taking the time to to be on this podcast and um beautiful likewise yeah it's a it's an honor to get to have two conversations in two weeks with you and i feel the same about you that there's definitely um ways that we can continue to support and enhance each other's work and even work on something together so excited for um what that could be mm -hmm.